part 4 of the Dungeon Master's Guide to the Curse of Strahd. This video follows on from part 3, where we learnt of the village Kresek and its celestial experiments. In this portion of the guide, we'll be looking at the following locations of Barovia. Yester Hill, the Werewolf Den, the ruins of Berez, an old bone grinder. Chapter 14 Yester Hill The druids who worship Strahd as the lord of the land and the master of the weather convene here, atop Yester Hill, on the very edge of Strahd's domain. This hill is also where the evil blights that walk the Salovich woods are born, and where Strahd comes on occasion to glimpse his ancestral home. Areas of the Hill the following location corresponds to the label of the map of Yester Hill. Area Y1 The Trail The trail through the thick woods leads to a hill covered with dead grass and cairns of black rock. Dark ominous clouds gather high above, and a single bolt of lightning strikes the hilltop. West of the hill, the land, the woods, and the sky vanish behind a towering wall of fog. The trail splits as it climbs the hillside, forming two concentric rings, area Y2. The trail also leads to the hilltop, areas Y3 and Y4. The wall of fog, area Y5, marks the edge of Stride's domain. Area Y2 Berserker Khans Dirt trails run along two concentric rings of Khans that encircle the hillside, each Khan is a ten-foot-high mound of slimy black rocks. These burial mounds predate the arrival of Strahd and the Druids. They have remained undisturbed for centuries. Buried under the rocks are the mouldy bones of an ancient tribe of berserkers that once lived in the mountains. See the Blood Spear of Kavan in the Special Events section. Area Y3 The Druid Circle Atop the hill is a wide ring of black boulders and smaller rocks that collectively form a makeshift wall enclosing a field of dead grass. Lightning strikes the edge of the ring from time to time, illuminating a ghastly 50 foot tall statue made of tightly woven twigs and packed with black earth. The statue resembles a towering cloaked man with fangs. The ring of boulders that surrounds the field is 250 feet in diameter and ranges from 5 to 10 feet high. Any creature that climbs over the black boulders has a 10% chance of being struck by lightning, taking 44 or 8d10 lightning damage. Characters can avoid the damage by sticking to the two trails that pass through the ring. Wooden Statue The giant statue bears an eerie resemblance to Strahd von Zarevich. Close inspection reveals roots sprouting from the ground around its base. These roots are part of the Gulthus tree in areas Y4. They wrap around the statue, providing added support and durability. The roots not only prevent the statue from being toppled, but also allow the effigy to serve as a component in the ritual to create a tree blight. See the Druid's ritual in the special events section. Planted in the heart of this wooden effigy is a magical gem stolen from the Wizard of Wine's vineyard as described in Chapter 12. The statue has an AC of 10, 50 hit points, and immunity to poison and psychic damage. If the statue takes fire damage after being splashed with oil, it catches fire, taking 2d6 fire damage each round. If the statue is reduced to 0 hit points, it collapses and the magic gem tumbles into the field, glowing with a bright green light. Hidden Graves Hidden throughout the field inside the boulders are six druids, chaotic evil male and female humans, and six berserkers, chaotic evil male and female humans, all descendants of the ancient mountain tribe whose members are buried on this hill and covered head to toe in bluish grey mud. They have long, tangled hair and wild-looking eyes. To honour their dark god, 
They sleep in earthen graves under the covers made of sod and dead grass. Characters entering the circle who have a passive wisdom perception score of 16 or higher. Notice the dozen covered graves scattered throughout the field. The druids and berserkers rise from their graves and attack if anyone approaches or damages the statue, or if they are discovered and attacked. The druids are waiting to begin a ritual to summon forth an enormous tree blight. Only one druid is needed to complete the ritual, but the druids won't begin without Strahd's blessing. Thus, they are waiting for him to appear. The ritual can't be completed if the statue is destroyed or the magic gem is removed. If the characters discern or divine the gem's location with the aid of magic, they can try to dig the gem out of the statue's chest. Climbing up the statue is a simple matter, requiring no ability check, and a character within reach of the chest cavity can use an action to dig into it. Have that character's player roll a d20. On a result of 13 or higher, the character unearths a gem and can take it as part of his or her action. Development. If the druids and the berserkers are killed, their numbers are replenished as others return from forays in the Salovich wood. At the end of each day at dusk, 1d4 minus 1 druid and 1d4 minus 1 berserkers arrive until there are 6 of each. Area Y4. Gulthus Tree. At the south end of the hilltop is a sickly copse, a grove of dead trees and shrubs with a huge misshapen tree at its core. Blood oozes from the sap of its twisted trunk. Skulking around the tree are six gangly humanoid creatures covered with needles. Embedded within the tree is a shiny battle axe, beneath which lies a humanoid skeleton. The tree is a gulthish tree. See the blight entry in the monster manual. The roots of which extend deep beneath the hill. Lurking among the dead trees and shrubs are three vine blights, six needle blights, and twelve twig blights. The needle blights are plainly visible, but the false appearance feature of the vine blights and the twig blights allow them to hide in plain sight. The blights attack anyone who harms the Gulthus tree, which has no actions or effective attacks of its own. The Gulthus tree has an AC of 15, 250 hit points, and immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and psychic damage. If it is reduced to zero hit points, it seems to be destroyed, but isn't truly dead. It regains one hit point every month until it is fully healed. With a successful DC-15 intelligence nature check, a character can determine the entire stump must be uprooted for the tree to truly die. The Gulthus tree withers and dies in 3d10 days if a hallow spell is cast in its area. The Gulthus tree creates blights from ordinary plants and is the only tree of its kind in Barovia. If the Gulthus tree is killed, no new blights can be created within Strahd's domain. Award the party 1,500 experience for destroying the Gulthus tree. Roots of the Gulthius Tree Legend tells of a vampire named Gulthius who worked terrible magic and raised up an abominable tower called Nightfang Spire. Gulthius was undone when a hero plunged a wooden stake through his heart, but as the vampire was destroyed, his blood infused the stake with a dreadful power. In time, the tendrils of a new growth sprouted from the wood growing into a sapling infused with the vampire's evil essence. It is said that a mad druid discovered the sapling, transplanting it into an underground grotto where it could grow. From this Gulthius tree came the seeds from which the first blights were sown. The skeleton lying at the base of the Gulthius tree is all that remains of a human adventurer who was killed by blights while trying to cut down the tree. Treasure the dead adventurer's tattered leather armor isn't salvageable, but the axe embedded in the tree is a magical battle axe. Its handle is carved with leaves and vines, and the weapon weighs half as much as a normal battle axe. When the axe hits a plant, 
whether an ordinary plant or a plant creature, the target takes an extra 1d8 slashing damage. When the creature of non-good alignment wields the axe, it sprouts thorns wherever its wielder makes an attack with it. These thorns prick the wielder for one piercing damage after the attack is made, and this damage is considered magical. The Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveal that there is a treasure here, it is buried amidst the roots of the Golthus tree, behind the skeleton of the dead adventurer. Characters who dig in the ground under the skeleton automatically find it. Area Y5, The Wall of Fog Yester Hill gets its name from a strange phenomenon that can be observed by anyone who looks into the mist from the hilltops or the western hillside. As you look west to the Curtain of Fog, you see a white fortress on a hill above a great city. The city appears quite distant, maybe a mile away. The fog obscures all detail, but you can hear what sounds like the echo of a church bell. The dark powers have created a false image of Strahd's ancestral home within the fog, just beyond reach. Strahd comes into the hill on occasion to gaze upon the city, even though he knows it can't be real. The image tantalizes him. Any creature that enters the deadly fog is subject to its effects, as described in the Mists of Ravenloft section in Chapter 2. If the characters ask a non-player character spellcaster about the Wall of Fog, that person might relate an ancient legend about it. According to the mountain folk of Barovia, there was always a Wall of Mist near Yester Hill, even before the deadly mist entrapped all of Barovia. The ancient folk called the mist the Whispering Wall, for within it they could hear the whisper of voices from past and the future. They believed an ancient god gave up his divinity to preserve the world from destruction and that his last exhalation as a god produced this mist. Within it are all his memories of the world and all his visions of possible futures, and with proper preparation, a seeker could go on a vision quest within it. Some students of the arcane contend that the dark powers took a bit of that fog and twisted it to create the mists of Barovia. And perhaps that Strahd's domain is just a dark memory in the Whispering Wall. Special Events You can use one or both of the following special events while the characters explore Yester Hill. The Druid's Ritual You can allow this event to unfold regardless of whether the characters have visited Yester Hill. Even if the character doesn't experience this event as it happens, they can still deal with the aftermath as described in the Winter Splinter Attacks special event in Chapter 12. Strahd travels to Yester Hill, arriving astride his nightmare, Bucephalus, assuming the characters didn't kill it in the catacombs of Castle Ravenloft, or in bat form. Strahd's arrival prompts the druids in Area Y3 to rise from their graves and begin their ritual. When the ritual begins, the druids use their action to chant and dance about. To complete the ritual, the druids must chant for ten consecutive rounds, with at least one of them chanting each round. If a round goes by and none of the druids are able to chant on their turn, the ritual is ruined and must be started anew. If the Gulthius tree in Area Y4 has been reduced to zero hit points, the ritual won't work. Druids who realize that the tree is being destroyed know enough not to attempt the ritual. Strahd observes the proceedings, defending the druids if they are attacked, and retreating if outmatched. Development If the characters are present when the druids complete the ritual, read, A thirty-foot-tall plant creature bursts from the statue, sending twigs and earth flying. The creature resembles a dead treant with a green light seeping out of it. The creature that erupts from the wooden statue is a tree blight, as described in Appendix D, that the druids call the Winter Splinter. The green light comes from the magic gem embedded in its heart. The gem can be removed only when the Winter Splinter is dead. The druids command the Winter Splinter to travel north and lay waste to the Wizard of Wine's vineyard, 
as described in chapter 12. Although the characters might not understand what the druids are up to, they will no doubt wonder where the druids are sending the tree blight. As Winter Splinter travels north, its destination should become clear to the characters who have previously visited the winery and the vineyard. Whether they try to halt its advance is up to them. Tree Blight, also known as the Winter Splinter. Blights are evil ambulatory plant creatures, and a tree blight is particularly enormous in variety. It looks like a dead tree or treant, 30 feet tall, with spongy wooden flesh, thorny branches, and rubbery roots that trail behind it. It has blood for sap, and it is so saturated with blood that it doesn't catch fire easily. Vicious Carnivore A tree blight feeds on warm-blooded prey and takes perverse delight in causing carnage. It strikes with its heavy branches and crushes prey to death with its roots. It can open its gaping tooth-filled mouth and bite a creature caught in its roots. The roots of a tree blight can be severed, though cutting them causes the blight no harm. Blight Animosity A tree blight will often fight alongside other kinds of blights, but it hates other tree blights and will attack them given the chance. Tree blights also hate treants, and the feeling is mutual. Once the tree blight departs, Strahd commands the druids and berserkers to leave the hill so that he can be alone. As they flee into the woods, he gazes longingly into the image of his ancestral home to the west of Area Y5, the Blood Spear of Kavan. The spirit of Kavan is a long dead barbarian chieftain that reaches out to any one of the players, preferably a barbarian, druid, or ranger. Read the following text to that player's character. You hear a whisper, a deep voice carried on the wind. Long have I waited, it says, for one who is worthy. My spear hungers for blood. Retrieve it, and rule these mountains in my stead. Just like the mighty warriors from the early days of the Whispering Wall. The character feels drawn to one of the Khans on the hillside in Area Y2. When the character approaches within 30 feet of it, the presence of Kavan's magic spear under the rocks is felt. Treasure The rocks of the Khan are heavy, but can be rolled aside, revealing a blood spear, as described in Appendix C, lying amid Kavan's mouldy bones. Any creature can wield the spear, but only the character chosen by Kavan to wield it gains a plus two bonus to attack and damage rolls made with this magic weapon. Kavan was a ruthless chieftain whose tribe lived in the Balanok Mountains centuries before the arrival of Strahd von Zarevich. Although he was very much alive, Kavan had some traits in common with vampires. He slept during the day and hunted at night. He drank the blood of his prey. He lived underground. In battle, he wielded a spear stained with blood. This was the first blood spear, a weapon that drains life from those it kills and transfers the life to its wielders, imbuing the individual with the stamina to keep fighting. When you hit with a melee attack using this magic spear and reduce a target to zero hit points, you gain 2d6 temporary hit points. Chapter 15 The Werewolf Den West of Lake Baratok is a cave complex that the werewolves of Barovia use as a den. Characters who interrogate captured werewolves can learn of the den's location. Most of the werewolf pack is out hunting when the characters first arrive, including the pack's leader, Kirill Stoyanovich. The werewolves call themselves the children of Mother Night because they all worship that deity. Recently, a schism formed within the pack as a result of a challenge to Kirill's leadership. The rift began when another werewolf, Emil Torinescu, questioned the treatment of the children kidnapped by the pack. Kirill would arm the children with weapons and force them to fight each other to the death until only one child was left standing. The winner would then be turned into a werewolf, ensuring what Kirill called the strength and purity of the pack. Emil advocated keeping all the children alive and turning them into werewolves, thus increasing the pack's size. 
Emil believed that a larger pack would ensure the werewolf's survival, whereas Kirill saw a larger pack as too difficult to control and feed. This ideological divide could not be reconciled and led to many disagreements. The other werewolves were split between two camps, and it seemed likely that either Kirill or Emil would die before the conflict would be resolved. Then Kirill disappeared for several days, causing the other werewolves to wonder whether he had fled or had been quietly disposed of by Emil and his allies. When Kirill returned, he was accompanied by a pack of several dozen direwolves loyal to Strahd, and he brought word from Castle Ravenloft that Strahd was not pleased with Emil's attempt to fracture the pack. The direwolves took Emil back to Castle Ravenloft to face punishment, and he was never seen again. Kirill re-established his dominance, but his ideas and tactics didn't sit well with the pack's older members, and they certainly didn't please Emil's mate, Zalika Taranescu. She knows she can't slay Kirill on her own, and after what happened to Emil, the rest of the pack is unwilling to challenge Kirill's authority and face Strahd's wrath. Kirill won't let Zalika hunt, so she's more or less confined to the den. Travel Through the Mists the werewolves serve Strahd out of fear, believing that Mother Night has blessed him with godlike powers and eternal life. Although he can't leave Barovia, Strahd can allow certain creatures to come and go, such as the Vistani. He periodically allows the werewolves to slip past the misty borders as well, so that they can bring or lure others into his domain. Unlike the Vistani, however, the werewolves can't come and go as they please. Approaching the Den when the characters first approach the werewolf den, read, Above the tree line, carved into the side of a rocky mountain spur, is a wide, torch-lit cave that looks like a gap of the moor of a great wolf. One hundred feet above the cave's mouth, in area Z1, further up the sloping mountainside, and not visible from the cave mouth or its vicinity, is a rocky ledge, area Z8. A character can scale the slope to reach the ledge without the need for a climber's kit or ability checks. Areas of the Den The following areas correspond to labels on the map of the werewolf den. Mounted to the wall throughout the den are iron brackets containing lit torches. All areas are brightly lit, though shadows abound. Area Z1 Cave Mouth the open jaws of the wolf's head form a 15 foot high canopy of rock over the cave mouth, held up by natural pillars of rock. The ceiling rises to a height of 20 feet inside the cave. Torches in iron brackets line the wall. From somewhere deep inside, you hear the echoing sounds of a flute. Some of the notes are discordant, painfully so. The guards in Area Z2 spot characters in the cave mouth who aren't hidden. Characters can track the sound of the flute to Area Z3. Development If the characters arrive here with Emil Taranescu, as described in Chapter 4, Areas K75A in Castle Ravenloft, in their company or in their custody, then he can command the other werewolves in the den not to attack the characters as they make their way inside. Area Z2, the guard post. Here the cave splits left and right, Standing on a five-foot high ledge between the divide are two feral-looking women wearing shredded clothes and clutching spears. Adzana and Devanka, two werewolves in human form, stand at the guard of the ledge. They sound the alarm when they spot intruders. Any loud noise can be heard throughout the den, bringing quick reinforcements from area Z3 and Z5. The werewolves fight to the death. Area Z3 the Wolf Den Nine wolves and a werewolf in human form are here. The werewolf, Skenis, has 36 hit points and is too old to hunt. Left undisturbed, he plays an electrum flute, though not very well. The wolves are huddled behind him and go where he goes. Though well past his prime, he fights to the death to defend the den. He takes umbrage to anyone who kills any of his wolf allies. A five-foot-high stone ledge overlooks this large cave, which has a smouldering campfire at the far west end. The floor is covered in gnawed bones. If Skenis is reduced to zero hit points, read, The old man cackles, 
When Garil returns, he says to you with his last breath, he'll skin you alive. Treasure. Skenesis Electrum Flute is non-magical and worth 250 gold pieces. Skenis also carries a pouch containing 450 gold piece gemstones. Area Z4, the underground spring. A gash in the rocky ceiling allows the grey light and cold drizzle of the outdoors to seep into this dank, torchlit cave, where an underground spring forms a pool of water roughly 40 feet across and 10 feet deep. A 5 foot ledge to the north overlooks the pool. A similar ledge spans the eastern wall, with a rough hewn staircase leading up to it. A few crates sit atop the eastern ledge. The water is fresh. The ceiling is roughly 20 feet above the surface of the pool. The fissure in the ceiling is 3 feet wide at its widest point, and 6 inches at its narrowest. The crates on the eastern ledge contain heaps of adult-sized clothing. Area Z5 – Deep Caves a maze of torchlit tunnels and caves expand in front of you. Bones lie strewn upon the floor. The ceiling here is 10 feet high. The bones on the floor are a warning system. They crunch loudly underfoot, and creatures have disadvantage on dexterity stealth checks made to move silently through the area. Area Z5A, South Cave. Bianca, a white-haired werewolf in wolf form, who is Kirill Saronovich's mate, sleeps here. She reacts quickly to the sound of alarm, attacking any intruder she sees. Area Z5B, the North Cave. When Sensia, a werewolf in wolf form, sleeps here with Kellen, a ten-year-old werewolf in wolf form. Kellen is a non-combatant with 10 AC, 2 hit points, and a werewolf's damage immunities. He hugs a wooden doll that eerily resembles one of that of the characters, but is painted and dressed to look like a zombie. A tiny slogan is etched into the zombie doll, which reads, Is no fun, is no pinsky. When the alarm sounds, when Sensia takes Kellen to Area Z7, locking him in one of the empty cages, and tells him to take human form, which he does. She then joins her fellow werewolves in the den's defense. Kellen was kidnapped from his home in Liam's Hold, a hamlet in the Forgotten Realm setting. He was afflicted with werewolf lycanthropy, after winning one of Kirill's despicable contests. When Sensia has been tasked with training this newest member of Kirill's pack, casting a greater restoration spell or remove curse on Kellen ends his lycanthropy. Area Z6, Kirill's Cave. At the back of this cave hangs a curtain made of human skin. When home, Kirill Staranovich sleeps here in wolf form. Behind the ghastly curtain of stitched flesh, is a 10 foot high, 10 foot wide tunnel with rough hewn stairs leading up interspersed with landings. The tunnel ends at a secret door, beyond which lies area Z8. The secret door is easy to spot from the inside of the tunnel with no ability check required. Area Z7, Shrine of the Mother Night. Rough hewn stairs lead down to a torch lit cave and a bizarre sight. Wide-eyed children stand behind wooden bars and stare at you in terrified silence. The cave holds six wooden cages, their lids held shut with heavy rocks. Two of the cages are empty, and each of the others hold a pair of frightened children. A crude wooden statue stands between the cages. It bears the rough likeness of a wolf-headed woman, draped in garlands of vines and night flowers. Piled around the statue's base is an incredible amount of treasure. A woman in shredded clothes kneels before the statue. Behind the statue, two maggot-ridden corpses hang from iron shackles bolted to the wall. The ceiling here is 20 feet high. The statue is a crude depiction of Mother Night. Kneeling before it is a werewolf in human form named Zelika Taranescu, who is the wife of Emil. Believing her mate to be dead by Stride's hand, she prays to Mother Night for guidance hoping that the goddess might hold enough sway over Strahd to persuade him to free her beloved. Kirill has ordered Zulika to guard the prisoners. If the characters rescue Emil and return him safely to Zulika, she gladly releases the children. If the characters confirm that Emil is truly dead, either by their hand or Strahd's, she still might let the prisoners go if the characters help her deal with Kirill Storanovich, 
whom she blames above all. Zuleika sees the characters as an answer to her prayers and asks them to kill Kirill when he returns from his latest hunt. See the leader of the pack in the special events section. Each of the eight children imprisoned here has an AC of 10, one hit point and no effective attacks. To determine a child's age in years, roll a 1d6 with a plus 6. The rocks piled atop each occupied cage can be knocked off or lifted off, allowing the cages to be opened. The children are in shock. Those who are set free don't wander far from the characters for fear of being eaten by wolves and werewolves. The corpses hanging from the wall behind the statue are two Barovian adults, a man and a woman, killed by the pack and presented as offerings to Mother Night. The werewolves consider the feasting maggots to be emblematic of the Mother Night's feedings. When the flesh of these corpses has been eaten away, the pack searches for new offerings to take their place. Treasure Treasure piled around the base of Mother's Night statue includes 4,500 copper pieces, 900 silver pieces, and 250 gold pieces. All coins are of mintages foreign to Barovia. 30 50 gold piece gemstones and 7 100 gold piece gemstones. 12 pieces of plain jewelry worth 25 gold pieces each and a finely wrought gold cloak pin inlaid with shards of jet worth 250 gold pieces. An ivory drinking horn engraved with dancing dryads and a satyr pipe player worth 250 gold pieces. An ornate electrum sensor with platinum filigree worth 750 gold pieces. Anyone who steals from Mother Night is cursed. The werewolves know this and thus don't go out of their way to guard the hoard. Any creature that takes a treasure from the pile is haunted by horrible dreams every night lasting from dusk until dawn. The curse only affects the creature who did the pilfering and isn't passed on to anyone else who might come into possession of the item. Returning a stolen item to the treasure's pile doesn't end the curse. A creature cursed in this way gains no benefit from finishing a short or long rest at night, but resting during the day works normally, since the curse is dormant from dawn to dusk. A greater restoration or remove curse spell cast on the creature ends the curse on it. The curse on the creature also ends if it leaves Barovia. The Fortunes of Ravenloft if your card rating reveals that the treasure is here, it is lying amidst the other items at the base of the statue. The curse described above applies to this treasure as well. Area Z8, the Ring of Stone. A 20 foot diameter ring of stone dominates the rocky ledge on the mountainside. Within the ring you see splattered blood and small gnawed bones. Lying on the ground outside the circle are several spears stained by dry blood. The werewolf pack convenes here to watch the young prisoners fight with spears in the stone ring. The last child standing is bitten and turned into a werewolf. Then the bodies of the dead are devoured, their bones picked clean. Set into the mountainside is a secret door that can be pushed open to reveal a tunnel with rough hewn stairs leading down to area Z6. Special Events you can use one or both of these special events when the characters are exploring or resting in the den. Leader of the Pack This event doesn't occur if the characters previously encountered and defeated Kirill's hunting pack, C. Pack Attack, in the special events of Chapter 11. Every hour the characters spend inside the werewolf den, roll a d20. On a roll of 18 or higher, the werewolf hunting party returns, dragging a dead mountain goat. It's a meager feast at best. The party consists of Kirill Staranovich, a werewolf with 90 hit points, 6 normal werewolves, and 9 wolves. All the werewolves arrive in wolf form. If the wolves can see evidence of an assault on the den, such as the guards of Area Z2 absent or dead, the werewolves assume hybrid form. Kirill sends 3 werewolves up the mountainside in Area Z8 to enter the den from above, while he and the remaining hunting party make their way deeper into the den. Development As long as Kirill lives, the characters can't negotiate with the werewolves. If Kirill dies and the characters have the upper hand, the pack is willing to negotiate with them. If Emil Tyrannescu is presented when Kirill returns, Emil is determined to kill his rival and become the new pack leader. 
If he succeeds, he allows the characters to leave the den unmolested, but refuses to release the kidnapped children unless Zuleika is present to convince him otherwise, because she fears that the characters might kill her husband if he doesn't let go of the children. If both Kirill and Emil die, Zuleika becomes the pack leader and cuts all ties to Strahd. The ordinary wolves leave the pack once Strahd becomes aware of this development. If the characters were drawn into Barovia by the werewolves in the mist adventure hook, the werewolf attacks on the Sword Coast come to an end under Zalika's leadership. If she is also dead, a young but fierce werewolf named Franz Groza becomes pack leader. He is vicious and treacherous, showing the characters no mercy. Die Kinder If the characters get the children away from the den while Kirill is alive, Kirill reassembles his hunting party and pursues the lost prisoners relentlessly. If Kirill is dead, the werewolf pack is too preoccupied with determining Kirill's successor to organize a hunting party. If the characters aren't sure where to take the children, a were-raven as described in Appendix D, that has been spying on the den in raven form, assumes hybrid form and suggests that they take refuge in a nearby village of Krezek as described in Chapter 8. If the characters head that way, the were-raven scouts from overhead until the characters reach the village, whereupon it flies south to the Wizard of Wines winery as described in Chapter 12 and reports what has happened to Davian Martikov. The children are understandably traumatized by the imprisonment in the werewolf den. They cry and scream the whole time they are with the characters. A calm emotion spell quells their anguish for the duration of the spell, with no saving throw required. A character can try to silence the children for a longer period of time using intimidation or by offering them hope, real or otherwise. The character must make a DC 15 Charisma, Intimidation, Persuasion or Deception check as appropriate. If the check succeeds, the children remain silent until something happens to frighten them. If the characters take the children to Krezek, the villagers there look after the children and see that they are fed and properly clothed. If the characters take them to Valakai instead, the Martikovs allow the children to stay at the Blue Water Inn until the characters return to collect them. Chapter 10 The Ruins of Berez Long before Irina Kolyana, there was a peasant from Berez named Marina. The vampire Strahd first met Marina in this small village on the shore of the Luna River. Marina bore a striking resemblance to Strahd's beloved Tatiana, both in appearance and manner, and she became Strahd's obsession. He seduced her in the dead of night and feasted on her blood. But before she could be turned into a vampire, the burgomaster of Berez, Laszlo Ulrich, with the aid of a local priest named Brother Grigor, killed Marina to save her soul from damnation. Enraged, Strahd slew the priest and the burgomaster, then used his power over the land to swell the river, flooding the village and forcing the residents to flee. Later, the marsh crept in, preventing the villagers from returning. Berez has remained mostly abandoned since. The ruins of Berez are now the home to Babalasaga, as described in Appendix D, an almost mythic figure tied to Strahd's ancient past. A hermit, she spends most of her time crafting and animating scarecrows to hunt down and kill the ravens and were-ravens that infest Strahd's domain. When she isn't working evil magic, Babalasaga sacrifices beasts to the Mother of Night and collects their blood, then bathes in the blood on the night of the new moon in a ritual to stave off the effects of extreme old age. Baba Lasaga recently stole a magic gemstone from the Wizard of Wine's vineyard as described in chapter 12, in the hope that the were-ravens who protect the vineyard will try to reclaim it. She keeps it in her hut as bait to lure her enemies to their deaths. The gem has given her hut a semblance of life. Approaching the Ruins The following box text assumes that the characters approach Berez from the north, along the trail leading from the old Sulevich Road. If they approach from a different direction, don't read the first sentence. The trail hugs the river for several miles. The dirt and grass soon turn to marsh as the trail dissolves into spongy earth, pockmarked with stands of tall reeds 
and pools of stagnant water. A thick shroud of fog covers all. Scattered throughout the marsh are old peasant cottages, their walls covered with black mildew, their roofs mostly caved in. These decrepit dwellings seem to hunker down in the mire, as though they have long since given up escaping the thick mud. Everywhere you look, black clouds of flies dart about, hungry for blood. The fog is much thinner on the far side of the river, where a light flashes amidst a dark ring of standing stones. The river ranges in depths, but is never more than ten feet deep. Muriel Vinshaw, a werewaver in human form, lurks amid the circle of standing stones in Area U6, and uses a lantern to signal the heroes. In the village proper, fog prevents a creature from seeing any other creature or object more than 120 feet away. A few sections of dirt road have survived, and these places are not difficult terrain. The marsh, however, is difficult terrain. Whenever the characters take a short rest or long rest in the marsh, even if they barricade themselves in a ruined building, they are accosted by 1d4 swarms of hungry flies, using the swarm of insects wasp stat block from the monster manual. The swarms don't trouble the characters in areas U3 or U5. Marsh Scarecrows Seven scarecrows stand guard in the marsh. They appear to be ordinary, non-magical scarecrows stuffed with raven feathers, until one or more of them are attacked, until Babala Saga commands them to attack, or until someone activates the howling skulls that surround Babala Saga's goat pen in Area U2. The Areas of Berez The following areas correspond to labels on the map of Berez. Area U1 Abandoned Cottages as you approach this cluster of ruined cottages, separated by low stone walls, you see a short stretch of dirt road that has remained intact. The cottages contain rotten furnishings and nothing of value. The wall that separates the cottages are three feet tall and easily scaled or circumvented. Area U2, the Ulrich Mansion. Towards the south end of the village lie the remains of a mansion built on higher ground it has been reduced to piles of stone and rotting timber. Empty arch windows stare at you. South of the ruin, an untamed garden runs rampant, surrounded by broken walls that are no longer able to contain it. East of the ruin, someone has erected a crude wooden fence, forming a circular yard in which several goats are penned. Surmounting the fence posts are human skulls. The ruined mansion is littered with the rotten remains of furniture and decor, the last burgomaster of Berez, Laszlo Ulrich, haunts the ruins as a ghost. If the characters search the mansion, the ghost appears before them. A ghost takes shape in the fog, assuming the form of a giant man, his features mutilated and his entrails hanging out like frayed ropes. Despite its intimidating presence, the apparition has a cringing light in its eyes. Why do you invade my home? Be gone! I beseech you. Strahd refuses to let the Burgomaster Ulrich's spirit find rest because of what he did to poor Marina. The ghost recounts Marina's sad tale if prompted. Only by convincing Ulrich that Marina has been reborn in the form of Irina Koliana can the characters put the tortured spirit to rest. The ghost must see Irina in the flesh and can't travel beyond the confines of the crumbled mansion. Ulrich's ghost is neutral good. It attacks if threatened, or if the characters begin searching the ruined mansion for treasure. If the ghost is reduced to zero hit points, it reforms after 24 hours. The characters receive experience points for the ghost only if they lay Ulrich's spirit to rest, not if they defeat the ghost in combat. Fortunes of Ravenloft If your card reading reveals a treasure is hidden in Berez, Ulrich's ghost points the characters to the treasure's true location, saying these words as it fades away. Travel west. Two hundred paces from the mansion lies a monument to my folly and the treasures you seek. Characters who follow Ulrich's direction end up in Area U5, Cellar. Buried under rubble inside the mansion is a stone staircase that leads down to an intact cellar, 
A single character can clear rubble in four hours, and multiple characters working together can reduce the time proportionally. The cellar is a 30-foot square room with mortared stone walls, a 10-foot high ceiling supported by wooden beams, and a floor submerged under three inches of stagnant water. The cellar contains two dozen empty rotten casks from the Wizards of Wine winery. Each cask is labelled Champagne de la Stomp. Garden The garden behind the ruined mansion has run wild. Hidden behind tall weeds and thorny vines are nude sculptures of handsome men and beautiful women, as well as carved stone benches. Four giant poisonous snakes attack characters who venture more than ten feet inside the garden. Goat Pen Baba Lasaga captures goats and uses their blood in her rituals of longevity. Nine goats are trapped behind this fence. Fifty human skulls are mounted on tops of the fence posts, spaced ten feet apart. There is no gate in the fence, and Baba Lasaga uses her flying skull, as seen in Area U3, to enter and leave the pen. If characters try to set the goats free by dismantling or damaging part of the fence, the skulls atop the fence posts begin howling and continue to howl for one minute. The racket attracts Babala Saga, who arrives in her flying skull on initiative count 20 in two rounds. The howling skulls also attract the seven scarecrows in the marsh, as described in the marsh scarecrow section previously. Roll initiative once for all the scarecrows. Area U3 Babala Saga's hut. Someone has built a ramshackle wooden hut on the stump of what once was an enormous tree. The rotting roots of the stump thrust up from the mire like legs of a gigantic spider. An open doorway is visible on one side of the hut, beneath which floats the upside down, hollowed out skull of a giant. Flanking the hut's doorway are two iron cages that dangle like hideous ornaments from the eaves. Scores of ravens are trapped in each one. They squawk and flutter their wings excitedly as you approach. Baba Lasaga, as described in Appendix D, is inside her hut unless she has been drawn forth by activity elsewhere. The squawks of the birds are music to her ears, but the noise makes it impossible for her to hear anyone approaching. Only the howling of the skulls in Area U2, or the sounds of nearby combat, are loud enough to be heard over the squawking. Inside each cage is a swarm of ravens that fiercely attacks Baba Lasaga and her scarecrows if released. Each cage is held shut by one of Baba Lasaga's arcane lock spells, and opening it requires a knock spell or a successful DC 20 strength check. A character can also pick the lock with thieves tools and a successful DC 20 dexterity check. Giant Skull The upside down skull that floats next to the hut is a hill giant skull that Baba Lasaga has hollowed out and transformed into a vehicle. It hovers in place until Baba Yaga commands it to fly, which it can do only while inside it. It has a flying speed of 40 feet. No one else can control the skull. A creature inside the skull has three-quarter cover against attacks made from outside the skull. The skull is big enough to hold one medium creature. It has an armor class of 15, with 50 hit points and immunity to poison and psychic damage. The Hut Interior The hut is 15 feet on a side and packed with old furniture, including a wooden cot, a wicker cabinet, a slender wardrobe, a wooden table, a stool, a barrel-topped wooden chest reinforced with brass bands, and an iron tub stained with blood. In the middle of the room is a ghastly wooden crib with a small, angelic child sitting in it. All furnishings except for the crib are bolted to the floor. Beneath the crib, a green light seeps up through the cracks through the rotting floorboards. The child and the crib are illusions created by Baba Lasaga using a programmed illusion spell. Baba Lasaga refers to the child as Strad and created the illusion out of madness because she considers herself a protective mother. Beneath the hut's rotting floorboards, is a three-foot-deep cavity containing the magic green glowing gem that Baba Lasaga took from the Wizard of Wine's winery. This gem animates the hut as described in the Creeping Hut special events. 
the floorboards can be ripped up or smashed with a successful DC 14 strength check. Characters can also break through the floor by dealing 10 damage to it. The hut doesn't give up the gemstone easily, however, as described in Babala Saga's Creeping Hut. If the gem is destroyed or removed from the cavity, the hut becomes incapacitated. Babala Saga keeps soiled robes in the wardrobe and assorted spell components in the wicker cabinet. The tub is where she ritually bathes in blood to prevent aging, as described in the Gifts of Mother Night. If the characters approach the hut at an appropriate time without being noticed, they can see Baba Lasagya bathing. Baba Lasagya. Two women gave life to Strad von Zarovich. The first was Queen Ravnovia van Rowen, Strad's biological mother. The second was the Queen's midwife, a devout follower of Mother Night named Baba Lasagya. Although it was the former who raised Strad and enabled him to follow in his father's footsteps, it was the latter who sensed a potential for greatness and a darkness in Strad surpassing that of any other mortal. Lasagya believed then, as she believes now, that she is Strad's true mother. Other Mother When Strad was still a baby in his crib, Baba Lasaga cast protective spells on him and crept into his nursery on stormy nights to sing magical rhymes to him. She also placed the spark of magic in him, ensuring that he would become a spellcaster. Baba Lasagya's unhealthy attachment to the baby Strad did not go unnoticed. After she received several disturbing reports, Queen Ravnovia was forced to banish the midwife from the kingdom. Lasaga never saw Strad again but she has succeeded in staying alive to witness the triumph of her beloved boy, who, in her mind, is eternally blessed. Despite the horrors Strahd has wrought, the saga still envisions him as the perfect child she delivered into the world. Strahd is the only thing in her life that matters to her. Mother Nearest During her exile, Babala Saga made countless sacrifices to Mother Night, pleading with the goddess to afflict Queen Ravnovia with ill health and visit death upon her, the saga eventually got her wish, and after Strahd settled in the valley of Barovia, the saga moved as close to him as she dared to. In the filth-ridden depths of her heart, the saga knows that Strahd would never accept her as his true mother, nor could she bear his rejection. As a result, she has never confronted him, she would rather exist in perpetual denial, would ling away the days, months, and years practicing fell magic and looking for ways to help her son. Raven Bane Baba Lasaga has allies in Castle Ravenloft, a coven of witches. Through the aid of these witches, Lasaga recently uncovered a potential threat to Strad, a secret society of were-ravens called the Keepers of the Feather a group that uses ordinary ravens as their spies. Strahd doesn't consider the were-ravens a serious threat, but Lasaga has chosen to make them the bane of her existence. After much searching and scrying, she has discovered a were-raven refuge at the Wizard of Wine's winery as described in Chapter 12, and she has begun to wage war against it. In addition, she has forged an alliance with the mad druids that haunt Yester Hill as described in Chapter 14 convincing them that she gave birth to Strad, whom the druids consider a god. With the druids on her side, she expects to rid Barovia of its were-raven menace. Gifts of Mother Night The goddess Mother Night has bestowed magical gifts on Babala Saga as reward for her ceaseless devotion to Strad. Her skin has the resilience of stone, she is resistant to harmful magic, and she is shielded against divination magic. Mother Night has also imparted to Lasaga the secret of longevity, which requires her to bathe in the blood of beasts on nights of the new moon. Failure to do so causes Lasaga to age rapidly, becoming mere dust and bones in a matter of seconds. Baba Lasaga's Traits Her ideal is, No love is greater than a mother's love for her son. Her bond is, I am the mother of Strahd. Anyone who disputes this fact can rot. Her floor is, I will not rest until the last of my son's enemies are destroyed. 
Bubba Lasaga is one of the most dangerous creatures within Barovia. She is similar to that of a hag, but much more powerful. In addition to her magical and mundane abilities, she also has many allies within Barovia, such as the Barovian witches of Castle Ravenloft and the druids of Yester Hill. She can transform into a swarm of insects, allowing her to escape from combat or to spy on her enemies. She can also summon swarms of insects to harass her enemies. She has the blessing of Mother Night, which constantly provides her with the non-detection spell, preventing her from being divine through divination magic. She can cast spells similar to that of a 16th level wizard. Her cantrips are Acid Splash, Firebolt, Light, Mage Hand, and Prestigitation. She has the following spells prepared. At first level with four slots, she has Detect Magic, Magic Missile, Sleep, and Witch Bolt. At second level with three slots, she has Crown of Madness, Enlarge and Reduce, and Misty Step. At third level with three slots, she has Dispel Magic, Fireball, and Lightning Bolt. At fourth level with three slots, she has Blight, Evard's Black Tentacles, and Polymorph. At fifth level with two slots, she has Cloud Kill, Geus, and Scrying. At sixth level with one slot, she has Programmed Illusion and True Seeing. At seventh level with one slot, she has Finger of Death and Mirage Arcan. At eighth level with one slot, she has Power Word Stun. Bubba Saga's Creeping Hut Bubba Saga built a hut atop a rotting stump of a giant tree that was felled long ago. It was only after she embedded the magic gemstone in the hut that the whole thing was imbued with a semblance of life. When she wills it to do so, the hut pulls its gigantic roots free of the earth and shambles around like a spidery behemoth, shaking the ground with every step. The hut attacks with its flailing and stomping roots. It can also use its roots to fling large rocks. The hut interior. The hut interior is a 15 foot square, ramshackle wooden building with a gently sloping thatched roof. Its furnishings have been bolted to the floor since the hut lurches from side to side when it walks. The heart of the hut. The gemstone that has given life to Bubba Lasaga's hut was previously buried in the Wizard of Wine's vineyard. The gem was one of three imbued with life-giving magic that made the grapevines in the vineyard healthier, guaranteeing the finest wines. Bubba Lasaga stole one of the gems and perverted its magic, using it instead to animate her wooden hut. Removing the gem from the hut renders the hut incapacitated. That task is easier said than done, however. The glowing green gem is contained in a cavity in the stump beneath the rotted floorboards of the hut. The floorboards can be ripped up with a successful DC-14 strength check or smashed by dealing 10 damage to them. Once the floorboards are out of the way, a creature can reach into the cavity and snatch the gem. But if someone attempts to do this while the hut is alive, the cavity sprouts wooden teeth, becoming a mouth that bites anything that tries to remove the gem. A creature trying to remove the gem must make a DC-20 dexterity saving throw. On a successful save, the creature claims the stone without getting bitten. On a failed save, the creature is bitten for 10 or 3d6 piercing damage and fails to obtain the gem. Bubba Lasaga's creeping hut is a gargantuan construct with powerful attacks that involve slamming creatures with its roots or hurling rocks at creatures far away. It does, however, have antimagic susceptibility, which means that if it moves into an area of an antimagic field, or if it's targeted by a dispel magic and fails a constitution saving throw, it will fall unconscious. Treasure The wooden chest in the hut is protected by a glyph of warding that requires a DC-17 intelligence investigation check to find. The glyph deals 5d8 thunder damage when triggered, Opening the lid releases four crawling claws that fight until destroyed. Also contained in the chest are various items that Bubba Saga has taken from dead adventurers over the years. 1,300 gold pieces, five 500 gold piece gemstones, a vial containing oil of sharpness, two spell scrolls, mass cure wounds and revivify, 
a pouch containing 10 plus 1 sling bullets, a set of pipes of haunting, a stone of good luck, fortunes of Ravenloft. If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Nine of Stars, the Conjurer, it is in the chest with the other items. Area U4, the churchyard. Through the fog, you see the empty shell of an old stone church, north of which is a cemetery of leaning gravestones enclosed by a disintegrating iron fence. Half of the cemetery has sunk into the mire. Rotted coffins and mouldy bones are buried in the graveyard. Characters who explore the gutted church find the rotten remains of a pulpit and an old iron bell half immersed in the marsh, lying amidst the remains of a collapsed steeple. Area U5, Marina's Monument. Strahd had this monument erected after Marina's death. The monument is hidden in the marsh, and the characters aren't likely to find it on their own unless they scour through the area thoroughly. If they lay Burgomaster Ulrich's spirit to rest in Area U2, it points them to this location before fading away. Without Uruk's guidance, the characters must enter a square in which the monument is located and search that area. A character who searches the area for 10 minutes can make a DC 15 wisdom perception check, finding the monument on a success. If the monument isn't found, the check can be repeated after another 10 minutes of searching. The following box text assumes the characters have met Irina Koliana. If they have not, do not read the sentence that mentions her. Hidden by the fog, and elevated a few feet from the surrounding marsh, is a raised plot of land, barely ten feet on a side, enclosed by a disintegrating iron fence. In the centre of the plot is a life-size stone monument, carved in the likeness of a kneeling peasant girl, clutching a rose. Although her features are grey and weather-worn, she bears a striking resemblance to Irina Koliana. Carved into the monument's base is an epitaph. The epitaph reads the following, Marina, taken by the mists. Fortunes of Ravenloft. If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Three of Stars, the Enchanter. It is hidden in a cavity under the monument, which can be tipped over or moved to one side by someone who makes a DC 15 strength check. If the characters disturb the monument, you can read, The croaking fog and chirping crickets fall silent, and the stench of decay grows strong. You hear the trudge of heavy footsteps through the mud and water as bloated grey shapes shamble out of the fog. Seven distended human corpses have risen from the mire west of the monument. These walking corpses are 60 feet away when first seen. Using the commoner statistics for the corpses, but reduce their walking speed to 20 feet, and give them immunity to the charmed and frightened conditions. When a corpse is reduced to zero hit points, it splits open, disgorging a swarm of poisonous snakes. The snakes are hungry and fight until slain. Characters can take the treasure and flee, easily outpacing the snakes' swollen corpses. Area U6, Standing Stones a dozen moss-covering menhirs form a near-perfect circle in the spongy earth. These weathered stones range in height from 15 to 18 feet. A couple of them lean inward as if to share some great secret with their inscrutable neighbours. A wary-looking peasant woman lurks behind the tallest stone, a rusty lantern clutched in one gnarled hand and a dagger clutched in the other. The woman is Muriel Vinshaw, a were-raven, as described in Appendix D, and friend of the Martikov family, as described in Chapter 5 and 12. A resident of Valakai, Muriel spies on Babala Saga for her fellow were-ravens. However, she avoids the village proper, preferring to lurk on the outskirts. If the characters allow her to speak, Muriel warns them about the dangers of Berez, and arms them with the following information. Berez was abandoned long ago after the river rose and flooded the village. An ancient and powerful hag named Babala Saga lives in the hut in the middle of the village. When not in the hut, Babala Saga flies around in a giant skull. The scarecrows of Berez are murderous creatures under the hag's control. They surround Babala Saga's hut 
and serve as an early warning system. Baba Lasaga periodically sends her scarecrows to attack the Wizard of Wines, a winery and vineyard to the west of Berez. She has made enemies of the Markov family, which owns and operates the winery and vineyard. The hag has trapped several mountain goats in a pen near the ruins of an old mansion. Muriel assumes that Baba Lasaga feeds on these animals. Muriel avoids combat and flees if attacked. She conceals her lycanthric nature for as long as possible, and she doesn't willingly identify other were-ravens with whom she is acquainted. She can't be persuaded to accompany the characters if they decide to confront Baba Lasaga. However, Muriel knows Barovia well enough to point out other nearby locations that might interest the adventurers, including the ruined mansion of Argen Vostholt in Chapter 7, and the ancient burial ground known as Yester Hill in Chapter 14. Muriel grew up hearing stories about Yester Hill, specifically how they turned away from their ancient beliefs to worship the Devil Strad. Muriel knows that the druids visit the Circle of Standing Stones from time to time, and she does her best to avoid them. The Circle of Standing Stones This ring of men here is one of the oldest structures in the Balandoc Mountains, older than the Amber Temple, and much older than Castle Ravenloft and the various Barovian settlements scattered throughout the valley. The men here were raised by the same ancient folk who carved the megaliths near Old Bone Grinder as described in Chapter 6. Characters who have seen the megaliths can with a successful DC-10 intelligence check discern rudimentary similarities between those stones and the men here arranged here. The circle is a hundred feet across and the men here are spaced apart at regular intervals. The stones are located to the north, west, south, and east are taller than the other eight stones, which all have weather-worn glyphs carved into them that represent different animals. Characters who inspect the smaller men here can discern the following animal shapes have been carved into them. Bear, elk, hawk, goat, owl, panther, raven, and wolf. The standing stones are non-magical, however, druid characters who enter the circle can sense a powerful god once blessed this site, and that it still holds some measure of power. They can also sense one of its properties, namely that creatures within the circle can't be targeted by divination magic or perceived through magical scrying senses. The circle has another property that druid characters can't sense, but might discover when they use their wild shape feature within the circle's confines. Any druid that uses the wild shape feature within the circle gains the maximum number of hit points available for the form. For example, a druid character using the wild shape feature to assume the form of a giant eagle would have 44 or 4d10 plus 4 hit points while in that form. At your discretion, the circle might have other strange properties that have been forgotten over time. Although she knows something of the circle's history, Muriel is unaware of its properties. Special Events You can use one or both of the following special events while the characters are exploring the ruins of Berez. Creeping Hut Baba La Saga has given a semblance of life to her hut using a magical gemstone stolen from the Wizard of Wine's vineyard. If the characters overstay their welcome, she commands the hut to animate and attack them. If this happens, read, The giant roots beneath the hut come to life and pull themselves out of the mire. The hut and the roots lurch and groan, becoming a lumbering mass that cracks as it walks, crushing all in its path. Babala Saga's creeping hut, as previously described, is a ponderous construct that heeds Baba Lasaga's instructions and no one else's. It fights until destroyed, or until the gemstone that animates it is removed or destroyed. Baba Lasaga does everything she can do to keep the characters from obtaining the gemstone, without which the hut is incapacitated. Lost Battlefield This event occurs as the characters travel north of Berez after leaving the ruins. You hear the sounds of battle, but the fog has grown so thick that you can barely see more than 60 feet in any direction. Suddenly, the fog takes the forms of soldiers on horseback charging across the field. They collide with armoured pike bearers wearing devil-horned helms, 
As each soldier falls in battle, it turns into fading mist. Hundreds more soldiers collide in a storm of screams and clashing metal. Characters can move through this ghostly battlefield unscathed, and they can't harm the foggy forms around them. The soldiers aren't solid enough for characters to discern emblems or insignia, but it's clear that both armies are human. If the characters have not yet explored Argon Voss Vault in Chapter 7, add, You hear a thunderous roar, and seconds later a huge dragon made of silver mist glides overhead, dispersing enemy soldiers with each flap of its mighty wings. Its long reptilian tail slices through the air above you as the dragon carves a swath through the fog, affording you a fleeting glimpse of a dark mansion overlooking the valley. The dragon, like the soldiers, is a harmless phantom. The mansion that the character sees is Argon Vosthold. Chapter 6 Old Bone Grinder Once a grain mill that served Valakai, this slouching windmill is now home to three night hags, Morgantha and her wretched daughters, Bella Sunbane and Ophalia Wormwiggle. The hags are trapped in Barovia, but they like it here, using their chain shape action to look like Barovian women, a frumpy mother and her two homely daughters. The hags snatch children, devour them, and use their windmill's grindstone to crush their little bones into powder. This powder is a key ingredient in the hag's dream pastries, which they offer to Barovian adults who are desperate to escape Stride's domain. Made with the bones of the innocent, the hag's dream pastries allow Barovians to enter a trance wherein they can escape to heavenly places full of joy. When adults can no longer afford the hag's dream pastries, the hags offer to trade their pastries for Barovian children, thus preying on the adult's selfishness while acquiring the ingredients they need to make more pastries. This is how the hags sow corruption in Stride's domain, and why they don't take children by force. The hags are interested only in children who have souls. They prick each child with a needle. If the child cries, that's a sign the infant has a soul. Morgantha's Coven The hags possess the shared spellcasting abilities of a coven, as described in the Hag Coven sidebar of the Monster Manual. If one or more hag dies, the coven is broken. Morgantha tolerates her daughters only because they help her complete the coven. If one of them dies, Morgantha sets out to abduct and consume a human child so that she can give birth to a new daughter, as described in the Monster Manual. Morgantha gave her coven's hag eye to Sirius Bellevue, Stride's disfigured manservant, as described in Chapter 4 in Area K-62, so that she could spy on Castle Ravenloft, keeping an eye on the vampire. The hags are fearful of Strahd and respect his dominion over this land. For more information on the Hag Eye, see the entry in the Monster Manual. Hag Covens When hags must work together, they form covens in spite of their selfish nature. A coven is made up of hags of any type, all of whom are equal within the group. However, each of the hag continues to desire more personal power. A coven consists of three hags, so that any argument between two hags can be settled by the third. If more than three hags ever come together, as might happen if two covens come into conflict, the result is usually chaos. Shared Spellcasting While all three members of the hag coven are within 30 feet of one another, they can each cast the following spells from the wizard's spell list, but must share the spell slots among themselves. At first level with four slots, they have Identify and Ray of Sickness. At second level with three slots, they have Hold Person and Locate Object. At third level with three slots is Bestow Curse, Counterspell and Lightning Bolt. At fourth level with three slots is Phantasmal Killer and Polymorph. At 5th level with 2 slots is Contact Other Plane and Scrying, and at 6th level with 1 slot is Eye Bite. For casting these spells, each hag is a 12th level spellcaster that uses Intelligence as her spellcasting ability. The spell save DC is 12 
plus the hag's intelligence modifier. And the spell attack bonus is 4 plus the hag's intelligence modifier. Hag Eye A hag coven can craft a magic item called a hag eye, which is made from a real eye coated in varnish and offered fitted to a pendant or other wearable item. The hag eye is usually entrusted to a minion for safekeeping and transport. A hag in the coven can take an action to see what the hag eye sees, if the hag eye is on the same plane of existence. A hag eye has AC 10 with one hit point and dark vision with a radius of 60 feet. If it is destroyed, each coven member takes 3d10 psychic damage and is blinded for 24 hours. A hag coven can only have one hag eye at a time, and creating a new one requires all three members of the coven to perform a ritual. The ritual takes one hour, and the hags can't perform it while blinded. During the ritual, if the hags take any action other than performing the ritual, they must start over. Monstrous Motherhood Hags propagate by snatching and devouring human infants. After stealing a baby from its cradle or its mother's womb, the hag consumes the poor child. A week later, the hag gives birth to a daughter who looks human until her 13th birthday, whereupon the child transforms into the spitting image of her hag mother. Hags sometimes raise their daughters they spawn, creating covens, a hag might also return the child to its grieving parents, only to watch from the shadows as the child grows up to become a horror. Dream Pastries These pastries look and taste like small mincemeat pies. A creature that eats one in its entirety must succeed on a DC 16 constitution saving throw or fall into a trance that lasts for 1d4 plus 4 hours, during which time the creature is incapacitated and has a speed of zero feet. The trance ends if the afflicted creature takes any damage or if someone else uses an action to shake the creature out of its stupor. While in the trance, the creature dreams of being in some joyous place, far removed from the evils of the world. The place and characters in the dream are vivid and believable, and when the dream ends, the afflicted creature experiences a longing to return to the place. Approaching the Windmill the windmill's stone walls are easily climbed. Wooden floors separate the various levels. There are no lights within, since the hags have dark vision. Old Salovich Road transitions here from being a winding path through the Balatok Mountains to a lazy trail that hugs the mountainside as it descends into a fog-filled valley. In the heart of the valley, you see a walled town near the shores of a great mountain lake. Its waters dark and still. A branch in the road leads west to a promontory, atop which is perched a dilapidated stone windmill, its warped wooden vane stripped bare. Closer investigation of the windmill yields a few more details. The onion-domed edifice leans forward to one side, as though trying to turn away from the stormy grey sky. You see grey brick walls and dirt-covered windows on the upper floors, a decrepit wooden platform encircles the windmill above a flimsy doorway leading into the building's interior. Perched on a wooden beam above the door is a raven. It hops about and squawks at you, seemingly agitated. A character who succeeds in a DC-12 wisdom insight check senses the raven is trying to warn the party. After delivering its message, the raven flies off to Valakai, the town in the valley below as described in chapter 5. Beyond the windmill is the forest. Once atop the windmill's hill, the characters can see a ring of four squat megaliths at the forest's edge. Ravens can be seen circling in the air above the stones, which are described at the end of the chapter. Areas of the windmill. The following areas correspond to the labels of the map of Old Bone Grinder. Area 01 ground floor. The ground floor has been converted into a makeshift kitchen, but the room is filthy. Baskets and old dishware are piled up everywhere. Adding to the clutter is a peddler's cart, a chicken coop, a heavy wooden trunk, and a pretty wooden cabinet with flowers painted on its doors. In addition to the clucking of the chickens, you hear toads croaking. 
The sweet smell of pastries blends horridly with the stench that burns your nostrils. The awful odour comes out of an open upright barrel in the centre of the room. Warmth issues from a brick oven against one wall, and a crumbling staircase ascends the wall from it. Shrieks and cackles from somewhere higher up cause the old mill to shudder. The ceiling here is eight feet high. If the characters explore the room, read, Small human bones litter the flagstone floor. Baking in the oven are a dozen dream pastries. Morgantha checks them every ten minutes. The staircase curls up to area 02. The barrel holds glistening greenish-black demon ichor. Morgantha can use the barrel as a font for the scrying spell. She can also knock the barrel three times as an action to summon a dretch. The demon crawls out of the barrel at the end of Morgantha's turn and obeys the night hag's commands for one hour, after which it dissolves into a pool of ichor. Morgantha can summon up to nine dretches in this manner before the ichor is gone. Morgantha's cabinet contains wooden bowls full of herbs and baking ingredients, including flour, sugar, and several girds of powdered bone. Hanging on the inside of the cabinet doors are a dozen locks of hair. Amid various concoctions are three small labelled containers that hold elixirs. The first elixir labelled Youth is a golden syrup that magically makes the imbiber appear younger and more attractive for 24 hours. The second elixir, labelled Laughter, is a non-magical red tea that infects the imbiber with cackle fever. The third elixir, a greenish milky liquid, labelled Mother's Milk, is actually a dose of pale tincture. Cackle Fever This disease targets humanoids, although gnomes are strangely immune. While in the grips of this disease, victims frequently succumb to fits of mad laughter, giving the disease its common name and its morbid nickname, the Shrieks. Symptoms manifest 1d4 hours after infection and include fever and disorientation. The infected creature gains one level of exhaustion that can't be removed until the disease is cured. Any event that causes the infected creature great stress, including entering combat, taking damage, experiencing fear, or having a nightmare, forces the creature to make a DC 13 constitution saving throw. On a failed save, the creature takes 5 or 1d10 psychic damage and becomes incapacitated with mad laughter for one minute. The creature can repeat the saving throw at the end of each of its turns, ending the mad laughter and the incapacitation condition on a success. Any humanoid creature that starts within 10 feet of an infected creature in the throes of mad laughter must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw or also become infected with the disease. Once a creature succeeds on this save, it is immune to the mad laughter of that particular infected creature for 24 hours. At the end of each long rest, an infected creature can make a DC 13 constitution saving throw. On a successful save, the DC for this save and for the save to avoid an attack of mad laughter drops by 1d6. When the saving throw DC drops to zero, the creature recovers from the disease. A creature that fails three of these saving throws gains a randomly determined form of indefinite madness. Pale Tincture an ingested poison. A creature subjected to this poison must succeed on a DC 16 constitution saving throw or take 3 or 1d6 poison damage and become poisoned. The poisoned creature must repeat the saving throw every 24 hours taking 3 or 1d6 poison damage on a failed save. Until this poison ends, the damage the poison deals can't be healed by any means. After seven successful saving throws, the effect ends and the creature can heal normally. Inside of the chicken coop, there are three chickens, a rooster, and a few laid eggs. The wooden trunk has tiny holes bored into its lid, and it contains hundreds of croaking toads. Several toads escape if the lid is lifted, but they are harmless. Area 02, the bone mill. Unless she has been lured elsewhere, Morgantha is encountered here. This is where she grinds the children's bones to make powder for her dream pastries. 
A haggard, heavy-set old woman with a face as wrinkled as a boiled apple sweeps the floor, pushing around a few old bones and stirring up a cloud of white dust with her broom. She wears a blood-stained flower-caked apron. A long, sharp bodkin impales her bundled-up mound of grey hair. The dirt-caked windows allow very little light to enter in this eight-foot-high chamber, most of which is taken up by a large millstone connected to a wooden gear shaft that rises through the ceiling in the centre of the room. A stone staircase continues up towards the sound of loud cackling. The old woman is Morgantha, a night hag. She doesn't mind visitors, as long as they've come to do business. She tries to sell her latest batch of dream pastries, charging one gold piece for each one. She's proud of her confections, and claims that she uses only the finest ingredients. If the characters seem uninterested in her wares, she bellows, Be gone! If they attack or refuse to leave, she calls out to her daughters and turns to fight. The hags operate the millstone manually, since the arms of the windmill no longer function. Area 03, the bedroom. The night hags Bella Sunbane and Ophalia Wormwiggle are here, unless they have been drawn elsewhere. Dancing around a thick wooden gear shaft in the centre of this cramped circular room are two ugly young women wearing silk shawls and gowns of stitched flesh. Long needles stick out of their tangled mops of black hair. The women crackle with glee. In a rotten wood closet, there are three crates stacked one on top of another, with small doors set into them. Next to the closet is a heap of discarded clothing. A ladder climbs to a wooden trap door in a nine-foot hall ceiling. A mouldy bed with a tattered canopy stands nearby. Morgantha's daughters are repulsive even in their human guises. When they are not singing, dancing, or telling terrible jokes to one another, they are pricking captured children with needles to make them cry. Any attempt to free the children incurs the hag's wrath. The discarded clothing belongs to children whom the night hags have already devoured. The trap door in the ceiling can be pushed open to reveal area 04. Each crate is three feet square. The top one is empty, but the middle and lower ones each contain a captive child. The outward facing side of each crate is fitted with a small door that has an iron latch and iron hinges. It can be unlatched and opened easily from the outside. Two captured children, lawful good male and female non-combatants, were taken from the village of Borovia after being given to the hags by their parents in exchange for dream pastries. The boy, Freak, is seven years old. The girl, Myrtle, is barely five. Their crates are full of crumbs as the hags have been fattening them up. If freed, neither child wants to go home because of what their parents did. They both speak kindly of Ismark and Irina in Barovia, hoping to be taken to them. Treasure The hags don't use the bed for sleeping, but they store treasure in it. Six pieces of cheap jewellery, worth 25 gold pieces each, are stuffed in the mouldy straw mattress. Area 04 The Domed Attic You've reached the windmill's peak, a domed chamber filled with old machinery. There's not much room to move around. Light slips into the attic through small holes in the wall. Characters searching this space find a few old abandoned bird's nests. Fortunes of Ravenloft. If your card reading reveals that a treasure is here, the Seven of Glyphs, the Charlatan, it is easy to find, either tucked into a bird's nest or buried under some dirt in a corner. The Megaliths. The four ancient stones near the windmill were erected centuries ago by the valley's original human habitants. Each moss-covered stone bears a crude carving of a city, each of which is associated with a different season. The city of winter is shown covered in snow. The city of spring is arrayed in flowers. The city of summer has a sunburst overhead, and the city of autumn is covered with leaves. If the characters ask any of the priests or scholarly NPCs in Barovia about these stones, the characters are told that an ancient legend tells of four cities said to have been the cities of paradise where the Morning Lord, Mother Night, and other ancient gods first dwelled. Several ravens circle overhead, 
and one pecks at something on top the stone that depicts a city of autumn. Upon inspection, the characters see the raven is pecking at a dream pastry, and on the ground in the centre of the stone circle is a small pile of children's teeth. The hags place these here to desecrate the stones as an offering to the entity they worship, the wicked archfey, Sethlin of the Crooked Teeth. <laughs>